So, today I would like to speak about the Disney brand. More specifically, I would like to discuss what that actually means, and how it's continuing to degrade in the eyes of many consumers. The reason this topic struck me was because Disney leadership is just absolutely obsessed with the idea of reinforcing their brand, but the irony is that they don't really seem to understand what it actually is. Ever since Bob Iger took the reins of CEO in 2005, there has been a push to fundamentally shift the Disney brand away from what actually made it Disney, and more towards a hollow, hyper-corporate system of buzzwords that ultimately has led to a quickly growing negative perception of this company and its leadership. This is reflected in the lack of commitment to creating interesting attractions in its parks, destroying the overall guest experience in favor of sucking every single last penny out of everyone's pocket by implementing anti-consumer policies, and all the while talking down to everyone while they do it. Perhaps you haven't really been paying attention and you don't know what I mean, or you might know exactly what I mean and would think to yourself, well, it doesn't matter, the theme parks are always consistently packed despite these changes, and it doesn't appear that people are going to stop spending money there anytime soon. I definitely understand these perspectives, so that's why I wanted to create this video, diving into the specifics about how poor management's looking for short-term gain will ultimately damage the brands for this company, and what this realistically means for them in the future. So, if this topic is interesting to you, and you would like it to gain more exposure in the cultural narrative, give the video a like, share it around, and join me today as we explore the continued degradation of the Disney brand. Let me first ask you a question. What does the Disney brand mean to you? As a company with a pretty long history, it can mean so many different things to so many different people. People who don't really go to theme parks may first think about Disney primarily as a film studio, and even then, there's so much variation. Depending on your experience and what you like, you may think of Disney more in terms of its classic animated films. If not that, perhaps your vision is defined by the films of the era known as the Disney Renaissance, or perhaps it may even be the more contemporary films produced through computer animation. For people interested in leisurely activities such as cruising, perhaps Disney Cruise Line is their dominant association with the brand. As a theme park fan, I of course associate Disney with its various parks, and the quality of service both there and with its shopping districts and hotels. However, whereas I once considered Disney parks the gold standard of themed entertainment throughout the world, my perception has changed dramatically within just the last few years. While there are many things I still enjoy about the Disney parks and within its film and television divisions, the brand has come to reflect something very different. It is no longer about offering unique experiences, full of quality and detail that the Disney name was synonymous with. Instead, the thematic integrity of their various parks is being destroyed in favor of mediocre and underwhelming lands and attractions, hoping to provoke toy sales and inspire brand loyalty for the most casual of fans. What exactly does this mean? Well, I remember visiting Epcot with a few people back in 2019, and they were commenting on the details of the World Showcase pavilions. To them, only Disney could design parks with that level of immersion and detail, which to me reflects the power of the Disney brand. I found myself disagreeing with them, because first, Universal Parks also include this level of hidden detail and immersion, but people never really think about their parks in these terms because that specific aspect of their branding is not as strongly emphasized. I very much recall the many Disney specials on TV throughout the early oddies, covering the fascinating history of classic Disney attractions, and highlighting the many subtle details of new ones. Second, it occurred to me that the association of Disney with details made sense because we were in the World Showcase and that the buildings here reflected the imagineering of an older era, 
in which the park experience went beyond just theming, but was perceived as an expression of art. Today, we would never get something so interesting and unique as the World Showcase, with current leadership today using it as a backdrop to promote IP synergy and dropping in mediocre attractions meant to sell toys. Long gone are Epcot's days of trying to educate guests in an entertaining way, now instead treating them as ravenous consumers who will buy frozen merchandise if Elsa is shoved in their face on a poorly reskinned attraction. This is clearly evident with Remy's Ratatouille adventure, as the courtyard for the ride lacks the distinct details and architectural variety of the rest of the France Pavilion. I wouldn't say it's poorly themed, but if you take the time to notice, you can make the observation about how less interesting and varied the surrounding area is in comparison to the front. To me, the Disney brand has always been about going above and beyond to create the most interesting attractions possible, allowing them to stand out as the leader within the theme park industry. The overall experience comes first, and the merchandise sales come second, resulting from the positive experience that the park has tried to provide for the guests. Instead, this current era of Disney feels hollow and cynical, putting in attractions that feel like advertisements or brand promotion. For example, shortly after Bob Iger stepped into the role of CEO, he introduced a number of small changes meant exclusively to boost merchandise sales. One example is the introduction of characters from the Pirates of the Caribbean films into the attractions. The justification behind this was that guests were asking where Jack Sparrow was, and no, nobody was asking that. While not the most egregious move in not running the ride, it was very clearly intended to remind people of the film franchise and to provoke merchandise sales in the nearby gift shops. While I've gotten used to the change over time, I remember how jarring and unnecessary it felt when it first premiered. Another example of this was the 2008 reverb for Disneyland as a small world, incorporating in various characters from Disney films into this classic attraction, solely for the purpose of reminding children that these are characters that they like. Naturally, the gift shop at the exit of this attraction features many dolls of these animated characters. While I don't hate their inclusion in the ride, I do despise the cynical and pandering attitude behind it. But wait, you might ask, haven't Disney Parks been promoting Disney films since the beginning? That is absolutely true, but there is a fundamental difference between the Walt and even the Eisner era and now. When Disneyland opened in 1955, the center of the park was anchored, of course, by Sleeping Beauty Castle, taken directly from the film as it was actively being worked on. Due to development trouble, Sleeping Beauty wouldn't actually release until four years later in 1959, but the castle was always intended partly as promotion for the film. But that being said, let's address a hypothetical scenario, in which Frozen 3 is in development and Disney is currently building another castle-style park somewhere in the world. If that park opens with the Castle of Arendelle as the park's icon, meant its promotion for the film, would it be any different than Disneyland? Absolutely. One of my favorite elements of Disneyland is the many classic dark rides located in its fantasy land and based on various animated films produced under Walt. I'm sure that while these attractions work to help sell merchandise throughout the years, they are fundamentally different in that they seem to have been crafted with guest experience as the priority. For example, Snow White's Scary Adventures loosely retold the story of the film, yet distinguished itself by putting riders into the role of Snow White and focusing on her perspective as she evades the evil queen, emphasizing scary scenes in the woods. While the attraction was changed to become less scary as Snow White's Enchanted Wish in 2021, at the very least it's still a strong ride and execution. The same applies with Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, putting guests into an original story where they take on the role of Mr. Toad and cause mayhem in a runaway vehicle. While Peter Pan and later attractions like Pinocchio's Daring Journey and Alice in Wonderland would act as Cliff Notes versions of the films, they were still crafted with fun and engaging experiences in mind. 
In contrast, Frozen Ever After feels absolutely bare bones, stuffing in scenes just for the sake of exciting six-year-olds and compromising the theming of the Norway Pavilion. Walt's animated films were also extremely innovative, working as not just entertainment for families, but also as showcases for animation as a legitimate and serious form of art. If you're not familiar with the development process of Snow White, which was Walt's first film, then you may not recognize just how labor-intensive it was, or how innovative the animation was trying to be in emulating the movement of human characters when nothing like it had existed at that point in time. Walt's animated films were almost always pushing boundaries of art, and the attractions based on them only served to remind guests that Disney was not just there for fun, but existed as a culturally significant institution. While Walt himself did show less interest in the animated films over the years, Sleeping Beauty would work as his magnum opus as a producer, and that it was very technically challenging to produce, and utilized a unique style inspired by medieval art. While it is true that Sleeping Beauty Castle existed within the park as a form of promotion, it also stood as a symbol of artistry, an icon that reminded guests that Disney was a cultural force. In contrast, I don't hate the Frozen films by any means, but they are very sanitized corporate products that lack the artistry and themes of the films produced under Walt. I believe I used this example elsewhere, but contemporary Disney animated films are too afraid to let their audiences feel too much emotion. For example, Frozen has a sad moment with Anna being turned to ice, but the moment doesn't linger long enough to have any impact, and she manages to be restored just fine. In contrast, Walt was not afraid to let children process heavy themes such as grief, as Bambi's mother is shot in the woods and her death is permanent, shaping the rest of the story. Can you imagine what would have happened if Anna had stayed frozen in ice? What that would mean for the story and the development of Elsa as a character, having to live with the consequences of her mistake? Obviously, the film was trying to play things safe, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it definitely lacks content that could designate it as a significant work of art. So yes, the castle of Arendelle would be a completely different situation from opening day Disneyland. It would be a move of corporate cynicism rather than a celebration of art. Disneyland was also heavily based on various film and television genres of the time, as Adventureland, Frontierland, and Tomorrowland very clearly reflect the genres of adventure films, the western, and science fiction. Still, despite some small tie-ins over the years, like the Swiss Family Treehouse, the presence of identifiable IP never took precedence over the experience. This was even true for the most part throughout the Eisner era as well. For example, one of Eisner's largest changes to the parks was ramping up IP integration in an effort to attract teenagers and younger adults. Of course, the best example of this was working with George Lucas to create Star Tours, which opened at Disneyland in 1987 and Disney MGM Studios in 1989. Perhaps it may not appear impressive by today's standards, but using the motion simulator as a ride vehicle was extremely innovative for its time. Today, we're also spoiled with the randomized scenes through the CGI revamp of the attraction, but the practical film shot for the original version was also quite technically challenging and had a lot of creative effort put into making it as engaging as possible. Today, the scenes just feel like promotions for the latest Star Wars film because, well, that's exactly what they are. Despite being randomized, I almost always get a film from the sequel trilogy and I just don't care. I'm not saying that the Eisner era didn't promote IP synergy as a way to sell merchandise, but with only some exceptions, the attraction quality almost always took precedence over just selling to the park guests. To get this out of the way, a few bad examples would be replacing Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in Magic Kingdom with the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, an extremely lackluster attraction that is so boring that I often forget it's even there. Winnie the Pooh merchandise is extremely popular to purchase for infants, so I have no doubt that this is the reason for its existence. Another example of a poorly integrated IP from the Eisner era is The Living Seas with Nemo and Friends, a directionless, pointless attraction that was clearly assembled quickly after the surprise success of the film. It's a great place to escape the heat, 
but otherwise has no redeeming merits. Still, for the flaws of the Eisner era, attraction quality almost always took precedence over the IP, showing that leadership and the Imagineers were truly interested in immersing guests into a world that only just happened to be licensed. For example, Disneyland's Indiana Jones Adventure is highly regarded as one of the best attractions ever produced, and the Tower of Terror brings riders right into the Twilight Zone franchise, but in a way that just feels natural and immersive, and not as a giant advertisement. Even the great movie ride, which stunk in Disney films here and there, existed to use IP integration to promote a theme of celebrating cinema, whether it be Disney or not. Even among this, one of the greatest strengths of the Eisner era was the promotion of original ideas. So many interesting and innovative attractions were built, such as Test Track, Soarin' Over California, Mission Space, the original Living Seas, Space Mountain Mission 2, Extraterrestrial Alien Encounter, The Wonders of Life Pavilion, Maelstrom, and a handful of others. We of course also got the incredibly rugged Animal Kingdom, focusing more on simulating real-world environments and teaching Disney guests about the importance of the natural world. IP tie-ins such as Tough to be a Bug or Festival of the Lion King were also incorporated, but were done so tastefully and without compromising the theming of the lands. That's not to say that all of these were hits, as Superstar Limo carries the reputation as one of the worst attractions ever created, but at the very least it's interesting and was a genuine creative effort that had a degree of charm to it, even if it was hated for its time. The same applies with Journey into Your Imagination, and now the current iteration featuring Figment. I would rather take these over some bland and uninspired corporate advertisement meant to sell merchandise. The last true attraction of the Eisner era was arguably one of Disney's best, Expedition Everest. Not only is it just an ambitiously well-themed and iconic experience, but it's truly a showcase of the best that Imagineering had to offer. It told the story of your journey, not through direct exposition, but through the theming of the queue as you work to prepare yourself for an expedition through the mountains to reach Everest. It provides exposition on your journey and the issues of disturbing the Yeti, but does so in a subtle way that tells its story through deduction, observing the elements of theming around you. In 2019, Bob Iger had some interesting commentary on this. In an interview with Barron's, he had this to say about recent investment in the Disney parks. The acquisition of these brands and the creation of intellectual property behind them have had a tremendous impact on growing our returns at the parks. When you have Star Wars to market at the parks, Avatar is a good example, Cars Land, we're building a frozen land in Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Paris parks. The interest among the potential audience is higher. It's not like I'm going to ride some nondescript coaster somewhere that maybe is themed like India or whatever. No, you're going to Arendelle and you're going to experience Frozen with Anna and Elsa. Or you're going to fly a banshee into Pandora. Go to Cars Land. We built Radiator Springs. You're with the characters in that town. Not only was this an incredibly stupid statement because the popularity of Everest clearly proves him wrong, but it's also a complete dismissal of anything that they can't slap a marketable character onto. It clearly illuminates a shift for the Disney brand, away from interesting and quality experiences, whether IP or not, and solely into a cynical place that acts to promote popular brands. Bob Iger is certainly not a creative person. He came in as the next CEO, attempting to recover Disney from the madness of Eisner's late tenure, and definitely succeeded, but really did very little for the parks. On the media side, he understood the importance of mending Disney's relationship with Steve Jobs, and then successfully bought Pixar in 2006. He clearly saw that Pixar films continued to outperform Disney both financially and through their cultural impact and with traditional animated films continuing to seek diminishing returns at the box office, the creatives at Pixar would be a great asset for the company. 
Iger, of course, purchased Marvel in 2009, Lucasfilm in 2012, and Fox in 2019. While we have yet to see Disney really leverage Fox effectively, no doubt the acquisition of Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars did a lot for the company at both the box office and helped establish Disney Plus as one of the strongest streaming services out there. However, it's clear that while these brands can be powerful, a bad product can fail, no matter what name is attached to it. Marvel Studios have certainly exemplified what happens when you have the right leadership calling the shots, but the quality of Pixar films has certainly become inconsistent, and the failure of Kathleen Kennedy as president of Lucasfilm has become glaringly evident. Disney's Star Wars sequel trilogy was not a financial miss by any means, but as continued installments continued to get worse and sloppier, it damaged the brand in a pretty significant way. Iger purchased Star Wars thinking that it was a slam dunk, yet the damaged brand played a large part in Solo losing money at the box office, showing that popular characters and name alone isn't enough to bring in audiences. Even a cultural phenomenon as large as Star Wars isn't too big to fail, and by going all in on basing Galaxy's Edge on this new trilogy before it even concluded, the massive and overwhelming crowds that Disney expected never showed. Still, shows like The Bad Batch and The Mandalorian show that Star Wars is still at home under the Disney umbrella with the right creative people, so at the very least I do enjoy that Disney owns it, despite how much I hate their trilogy. Also to note is that besides a handful of their animated films like Frozen, Moana, and Wreck-It Ralph, there hasn't been a lot of culturally significant films coming out under Iger. Sure, the animated films do okay enough, or in the case of the Frozen franchise, very well, but the highest grossing films have otherwise just been live-action remakes of older animated films, mostly from the Renaissance. Otherwise, Disney live-action was pretty bad under Iger, and even the Pirates films managed to flounder because of how bad they were after Gore Verbinski left the franchise. The point I would like to illustrate with all of this is that brand name doesn't matter if your product is mediocre or even bad. Iger bought these different studios and sat back, letting them do what they essentially wanted. He got lucky with Pixar and Marvel, but Lucasfilm showed how easily a brand can be damaged with the wrong leadership. Iger may have been successful, but he showed a fundamental misunderstanding of these brands and relied far too heavily on them. This is best exemplified with introducing the Avatar franchise to Animal Kingdom. As Universal was on the decline in Florida throughout the late Audis, their parks were completely turned around with the introduction of Hogsmeade and Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey in 2010. Not only did Universal's parks receive a significant attendance boost, but they also took 4% of the Orlando theme park market share, which may not sound like a lot, but is roughly 24 million people. Also considering the profitability of Wizarding World specific food items like butterbeer or pumpkin juice, in addition to all the merchandise and wands being sold, Disney definitely took notice. It's clear though that this is where Iger's understanding of brand and intellectual property stops. He completely misunderstood that the effort and creativity that went into pulling off the Wizarding World was a huge factor for its success, and instead looked to high-grossing film franchises and concluded that Avatar was the way to go. As the highest-grossing movie at the time, Avatar's box office numbers were clearly the result of its technical CGI and 3D effects, and not because people were in love with a franchise that only had one film with only a serviceable story. Obviously, there are people out there who love the film and want to be completely immersed in its setting, but they're very much a minority of the box office performance. I've said it before and I'll say it again, putting Avatar into Animal Kingdom was an outright stupid idea. Its success is a fluke because the team handling its integration was led by legendary Imagineer Joe Rohde, who helped work the franchise into the themes and design philosophy of the park. It shouldn't have worked, and yet it was made to feel like a natural extension of the park's theming. Just a quick note, but I've quite literally spent half an hour discussing why this works so well in another video, so I recommend checking that out if you're interested in an in-depth breakdown of the land and its rides. It's clear to me that with any other team though, Pandora likely would have failed in execution, 
existing within the park as a poorly thought out and shoehorned attraction from out of touch leadership desperately chasing universal success. Even with as much as I like the land today, it still shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the Wizarding World. Outside of the attractions, there's not much to do, and lacks the interactivity of the wand magic. In addition, while the Shoulder Banshees manage to sell really well, Pandora offers little in the way of must-have merchandise. Meanwhile, Hogsmeade and Diagon Alley still continue to sell wands, robes, candy, and a variety of other items that are creatively fun and connect not just with fans of the franchise, but with a larger population of park guests. Despite how much I also enjoy Satouli Canteen as a quick-service restaurant, Pandora also fails to capture the popularity of butterbeer and other various food items found throughout the Wizarding World. What was Disney's response to such a popular drink? Frozen apple juice called LeFou's Brew at Gaston's Tavern in New Fantasyland. I mean, it's kind of pathetic. Who thought that this would really be able to compete? I will say though, I also actually really enjoy Cars Land, which opened at California Adventure in 2012. Does it have anything to do with the park? Absolutely not, because it's based on Monument Valley, which exists within Arizona. However, at least the land can be vaguely justified as existing within the park, as the original idea for the land worked as a celebration of California car culture. Despite this though, Iger wanted to incorporate the Cars franchise, which sells really well with elementary school aged boys, and thus the idea was warped as a cynical merchandising opportunity. But you know what? Despite not fitting the theme of the park, Cars Land is really well executed and manages to feel quite immersive. Its anchor attraction, Radiator Springs Racers, is far superior to the bland and boring Test Track 2.0, which premiered the same year. Like Pandora though, Cars Land serves as a lesson, and that it's not the intellectual property and branding that matters, so much as it is the quality of the product. In 2015, the man who is now CEO, Bob Chapek, would become chairman of Disney Parks, Experiences, and Products. It's worth mentioning that under Iger, California Adventure did get some major additions with both Cars Land and Buena Vista Street, but otherwise, Disney Parks managed to see very few additions that were not previously leftover projects from Eisner. Among the parks stagnating, came increased costs and a slow but steady decline in both attraction maintenance as well as park cleanliness. Despite increasing profits year after year, the parks were given very little investment unless it led to direct sales, such as the small IP inclusion in certain attractions. However, these things were minor and not too offensive, because the product generally remained pretty consistent otherwise. When Chapek came into the picture though, things really started to noticeably change. First, it was little things here and there, like rentable cabanas in Magic Kingdom's Tomorrowland, pop-up bars in unnecessary places like the lobby of the Polynesian, or cutting soap and shampoo bottles from hotels in favor of shower pumps as a cost-cutting measure. These things may sound trivial, but a key component of the Disney brand under Eisner was the Disney difference. Perhaps you paid a lot up front, but you were getting a world-class experience where you didn't feel like you were getting nickel and dimed at every opportunity. Pop-up bars don't need to exist in hotel lobbies, and were clearly there for a quick buck. That's a great segue into speaking about the ever-increasing sale of alcohol at the parks, though. Epcot today, as the most underwhelming of the Florida parks and its attraction offerings, is completely propped up by alcohol and food sales. I'm not one to complain about drinking in the parks because it's something that I like to do, but the park holding the reputation of being a giant bar only allows its degradation to become worse. At this point, the park is also in a perpetual state of existing as a giant food festival, which isn't inherently bad if it were any good, but suffers greatly from shrinkflation. If you're not familiar with the term, 
it refers to increased prices, but less product. Not only have the food festival portions gotten much more expensive, but they've also gotten smaller, and the quality has gone dramatically downhill. I see people excited to go to Epcot for these festivals, and I think to myself, why? The food at this point is essentially cafeteria quality, and is so Americanized, yet people treat it as some sort of adventurous or culture thing to do, but it's very clearly not. Just as with alcohol sales though, the park's attendance is pretty much propped up by these festivals, because Disney can't commit to the park in any meaningful way. Of course, with Chapek in charge, the festivals became perpetual, but their quality continued to decrease. Under Chapek, we've also continued to see a rather steady decline in attraction maintenance and park cleanliness, only making the problem that persisted under Iger worse. However, within just the last few years, the nickel and diming has continued to become far more brazen. For example, in 2018, Disney began to start charging for parking at the resorts. While this isn't unusual for resorts to do, it was always kind of assumed that the parking fee was included with the price of the resort stay. However, to charge for parking on top of what was already an expensive sum is just a blatant and unnecessary cash grab at this point. Paying for parking at the parks makes sense because it partially pays for their parking staff and the trams, but it's completely unnecessary at the hotels. It's quite literally charging you just because they can get away with it. The 2020 shutdown and the return with safety measures were also used as tools in order to implement other anti-consumer policies as well. First, entertainment was cut pretty extensively, and while many have excused this as the result of Disney attempting to save face after their parks were hemorrhaging money, these cuts had already begun prior. Another example is that in the era of social distancing and mask mandates, Disney cut their parking lot tram services. That's pretty understandable. Yet, to the date of this video being made, only Magic Kingdom has brought back its trams. There's really no reason the other park shouldn't have it, other than Disney has figured that enough people haven't complained about it, so there's no reason to bring it back. Another huge cut is the Magical Express, a bus service that was provided for free to Disney Resort guests that would take them directly from the Orlando International Airport into their resort. Not only was this great for the guests, but it made financial sense for Disney because it kept many people on their property exclusively to spend money there instead of traveling off-site. Resorts also saw other significant cuts to their perks, such as extra magic hours being reduced to only half an hour before opening, allowing you to queue up slightly faster than everyone else. On top of this, previous paid events like Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party was turned into an after-hours event, cutting almost all exclusive entertainment, almost doubling the price, and only letting attendees stay in the park for around four hours. Finally, the largest and most detrimental change was the implementation of Genie Plus. If you were somehow not aware, Genie Plus is a paid version of the previous free FastPass system, allowing people to pick return times to go through a queue called the Lightning Lane with a greatly reduced wait time. At a price point of $15 in Walt Disney World and $20 in Disneyland, it's cheap enough for most people to buy into, resulting in a large disparity between people who do and do not have it. Because of this, it causes many standby lines to slow down to a crawl, while attractions merge in a large number of people who paid for the service. How does Disney negate this? Well, they do limit the number of Lightning Lane selections available at any one time, but because so many people are paying for the service, there are often more people using the service than selections are available. What this means is that while many people would perhaps enjoy getting Lightning Lane for popular attractions like Pirates of the Caribbean or Big Thunder Mountain or any other selection of rides for the Magic Kingdom, oftentimes they're left with the more undesirable selections like the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Another issue is that while many popular attractions could remain available, many of the selections are taken up many hours ahead. Genie Plus only allows one selection at a time, so if it's 11am for example, and a popular attraction like Haunted Mansion had many of its time slots already snatched up, it's possible that you may not even be able to find another time until 5pm. 
That's essentially six hours of non-use for a service that you paid for, and that is often the case even on moderately busy days. Genie Plus works even worse at other parks, as Epcot, Hollywood Studios, and Animal Kingdom offer far less in attraction selection in comparison to the Magic Kingdom. Oftentimes, people pay to barely even ride any attractions, or only to get the least desirable. Meanwhile, lines for non-paying guests come to a standstill because the system is so flawed, and really, everyone loses except for Disney. The free FastPass Plus system that it replaced was also highly flawed, but at least you weren't paying for the diminished value. One last anti-consumer policy I would like to cover is the implementation of the park reservation system. It obviously made sense when the parks were attempting to find a way to limit their capacity, but it's clear that they are no longer doing this for safety reasons. Instead, the reservation system is used to give an idea to park management on how to slash park staffing to the bare minimum needed, dependent on attendance projections. Not only is the system confusing for visitors who are out of the loop on Disney's policies, but it's also incredibly inflexible for those on multi-day vacations or those who have paid for an annual pass. Another issue it causes at Disneyland specifically is that when park hopping becomes available at 1 p.m., a mass exodus occurs from both parks, trying to cross the esplanade and into the other, causing the admission process of both parks to become overwhelmed. Does having to navigate an inflexible system of park reservations just so that Disney can cut their staffing to the bare minimum needed sound like the Disney difference that is often associated with their brand? When I walk past overflowing trash cans or ride attractions with major effects not working, is it really on brand for the company that we thought it was? People often complained of price increases during the Eisner era, but what we got then were new attractions, new theme parks, and an excellent and fun experience. Yet here we are today with leadership blatantly cutting entertainment, perks, and a variety of other elements of the experience, using a global crisis as an excuse to implement these changes. The company no longer hides that it's sticking its hand in your pocket at every opportunity, and yet we continue to see a greatly diminished value. At this point, with the company refusing to build enough attractions to meet demand, it almost feels necessary to purchase Genie Plus, only for you to find out that it doesn't deliver. Yes, they have certainly built a slate of new attractions over the last six years, but never anything meant to address capacity issues and oftentimes replacing attractions that actually did serve that function, all because the company leadership would rather look good for shareholders than bother with attraction maintenance costs. To wrap this lengthy paragraph up, I think it has become quite clear how such brazen cost-cutting and the implementation of unpleasant anti-consumer policies has damaged the Disney brand. Still, something I haven't really covered is the massive transformation of the parks over the last six years, creating a truly monstrous problem. So with that being said, let's look into that next. Disney parks, for most of their history, have existed as the best theme park experiences in the world. The theming was often top tier, and contained an abundance of unnecessary details that fascinated millions of visitors over the decades. Yet today, none of that matters to Disney leadership. As I've already covered, the majority of attractions feel more like advertisements and less like quality additions. For example, while I actually prefer Remy's Ratatouille Adventure to the other trackless dark rides in Walt Disney World, let's not pretend that it's anything other than mediocre. I did speak earlier about how the area surrounding the attraction also illuminated discrepancies between the capability of the company in the past and the company today. In fact, if you take the time to notice while standing in the France Pavilion, you can even see the transition where the architecture becomes far less interesting and detailed. I've also already made my point about how Frozen Ever After is a lazy reskin of Maelstrom, shoehorning in a property that only superficially has any relation to Norway and only exists to sell toys. With the introduction of Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind this upcoming summer, 
it's clear that theming no longer matters in Epcot. Cue the D23 clip. This is what Epcot will become. It's a park that will be more Disney, more family, more timeless and more relevant to the millions of guests that visit us each year. A while ago, I did an entire breakdown of the classic attractions that opened with Epcot Center, and dispelled the myth of them becoming stagnant and outdated. In fact, I argued that this myth was created by Eisner because he wanted to replace attractions with either IP tie-ins or more thrill rides in an effort to appeal to teenagers and young adults. While attractions like Mission Space would fail to live up to the standards of something like Horizons, at the very least, the themes of discovery and humanism remained intact. This current branding of more timeless, more relevant, and more Disney shows how little Disney executives even understand their own parks. When I think of more Disney in Epcot, I think of the quality and ambition that the original attractions were shooting for. To me, an important part of what I associated with Disney as a brand was having their parks provide unique attractions that functioned as artistic endeavors, and not as just some place to drop in overpriced, yet still lazy rides that promote cartoons to elementary aged children. Last year, the Epcot Creation Shop opened, full of generic Disney merchandise and lacking any theming other than generic retail store. Does having Mickey plastered at the checkout counters make it more Disney? No. Having it tie into the themes of Epcot would instead be on par with the Disney brand, at least with how I knew it before the parks were transformed almost exclusively into shopping malls. I wouldn't fault Disney for wanting to make money off of merchandise, especially since the hyper-commercialization started in the Eisner era, but it's gone to a point where it's the primary focus, even over park experience and attractions. These lazy and often cheap feeling rides have also come at the expense of park theming, damaging another aspect of what made these parks once so distinctively Disney. Disneyland and Magic Kingdom have always been rather eclectic in the variety of themes contained within them, so this isn't really a problem there. However, if we take their other parks, which have been centered around a single but flexible theme, it has become clear that thematic integrity no longer matters if Disney can just plop down something that they think is Disney enough to excite ignorant consumers. Worst of these is of course Epcot, which obviously has no vision other than eliminating theme entirely in favor of a generic template that allows the parks to shove in children's characters. Hollywood Studios, until its most recent transformation, embraced two themes of celebrating historical Hollywood and bringing guests behind the scenes to view how films were made. This was the perfect template for incorporating in any property that they wanted, as even minor details like showing that the AT-AT in the Star Tours queue was in fact a prop, allowed a large degree of flexibility to put whatever they wanted into the park, as long as it tied into the movie studio theme. Yet the movie making aspect was eliminated in favor of immersing visitors into the movies, which would work and make sense if only Disney had bothered to actually implement it as a theme. The issue is that some areas of the park, such as Star Tours, the Backlot Express, and the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular still do have elements of going behind the scenes in filmmaking, which clashes with the rest of the park. Meanwhile, Toy Story Land, Galaxy's Edge, and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway were plopped down with nothing to tie them thematically to anything else in the park, making them feel like cynical corporate advertisements. The park opens with a great movie ride, celebrating the movies that built Hollywood it worked as a thesis statement for the park. As a classic attraction on par with Pirates, the Haunted Mansion, or the numerous early rides of Epcot Center, it was instead replaced with Runaway Railway, which has absolutely no thematic tie to anything. It's also an incredibly lazy attraction that suffers from poor pacing, it feels like riding around in an empty warehouse. Sorry Disney, but using projection technology on mostly flat walls and using a trackless ride system for what is essentially a linear attraction is a showcase of how far Imagineering has fallen. At least in Disneyland, they had the decency to place it in Toontown, even if the aesthetic style of the characters in the ride completely clashes with the characters throughout the land. I've already discussed this at length elsewhere, but obviously Toy Story Land is just filler. 
It's just an area full of uninteresting landscaping, some props strewn around, and an unremarkable flat ride and roller coaster. In a park that desperately needed capacity, it's underwhelming, lazy, and still helped very little. It obviously has no thematic ties with the park either, as it just kind of exists, sitting at the back. Of course, the largest addition to the park was Galaxy's Edge, which again has absolutely no thematic justification for being there. As with Toy Story Land, if you're going to justify these additions as immersing people into the movies, you could have at least bothered to do something other than just hoping that people wouldn't notice that this theme doesn't actually exist. I've also spoken pretty extensively about the failure of Galaxy's Edge elsewhere as well, pointing out how it would probably be strongly disliked if it weren't for Rise of the Resistance. It's a land where experiences like the lightsaber and droid construction are hidden behind pricey paywalls, and it offers very little else. In fact, Disney completely overpromised on the level of interactivity and character interactions that the land would contain. As quite a few people have pointed out, many of these experiences are locked behind the now $6,000 paywall of the Galactic Star Cruiser. I actually think that it looks like a cool experience, but it's still disgustingly overpriced and took all the elements that fans were hoping would manifest in Galaxy's Edge and instead hid them away from everyone except for those who were willing to pay. In contrast, Hogsmeade, Diagon Alley, and Super Nintendo World are attractions in and of themselves, full of interesting details and are highly interactive. Galaxy's Edge manages to feel like an empty shopping mall in comparison, and while Universal's lands also focus heavily on shopping, their merchandise feels like a natural extension of the theming. Diagon Alley feels like an interesting location first and a shopping location second whereas it seems as if Galaxy's Edge was built as a backdrop for generic merchandise hidden under a disingenuous ulterior motive. It's the difference between walking into an atmospheric shop such as Morgan & Burke's selling artifacts of the dark arts and Doc Ondar's antiquities, shoving in Star Wars references onto the walls just for the sake of it, and selling what is essentially movie memorabilia. Galaxy's Edge also fails in its attractions as well, as I've often been a pretty vocal critic of Smuggler's Run, working better as a Millennium Falcon photo op than an actual ride. It's really just a poorly implemented video game with a boring mission that feels more at home in the now demolished Disney Quest than an actual draw for the most expensive land ever created for a Disney park. I know that this is an unpopular opinion, but I also think that Rise of the Resistance is highly overrated as well. People seem to be impressed with it as an experience because it takes things a little bit further in its pre-shows, but the actual ride itself is rather unremarkable. There are plenty of other trackless dark rides that are far more interesting and creative in their execution, and I believe that too many people are impressed by what essentially amounts to a series of novelties. Rise isn't a bad attraction, but it quickly loses its appeal after the first few rides. Thematically, the best park is Animal Kingdom, because it has remained unchanged for so long, largely because Joe Rohde was around and had enough influence to protect it. As I discussed earlier, even Pandora was made to fit in well with the park. Still, I've heard plenty of rumors about efforts to make this fantastically themed park more Disney in areas where it's most unwelcome. One last major offender to the destruction of Disney theming would be California Adventure. While I actually enjoy this park better than Hollywood Studios, the theming being such a mess is a huge detractor. As mentioned earlier, Cars Land is really well designed, but has nothing to do with California. Mike and Sully to the Rescue is a decent dark ride, but doesn't fit in with the theming of Hollywood. Avengers Campus is a barely themed area that opens with one extremely underwhelming Spider-Man attraction and exists almost solely for photo ops. Finally, for all the complaints about how tacky and undisney Paradise Pier was, management really misunderstood that spending an obscene sum of money to turn it into the even tackier Pixar Pier made it even more undisney. Again, to make something Disney was to build an area or attraction of exceptional quality, and not to instead turn rides into Disney brand billboards. 
At its core, the Disney brand in relation to its parks has always been about exceptional theming and experience. It's not cheap attractions like Web Slingers or Slinky Dog Dash. It's not about saying, hey kids, would you like to buy a doll of your favorite character? Instead of creating attractions that feel substantial and provide a theming standard that cannot be found elsewhere. In their obsession with branding Disney parks, the irony is that Disney leadership has destroyed what made them once so interesting. From there, the question arises, how long is this sustainable? When you think of the Magic Kingdom, what comes to mind? Is it princesses? Is it Mickey Mouse? Is it screaming children? For me, I've always appreciated the different themes of the different lands and their respective attractions. Despite not being as good as the Disneyland version, Pirates of the Caribbean is still a standout. I also obviously enjoyed the Haunted Mansion, It's a Small World, Space Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain, and the majority of other attractions located within the park. It's obviously more than just princesses and Mickey, but there is a large demographic of people who absolutely don't know otherwise. Ignorant suburbanites who would denounce Disney as an overpriced children's playground, and who refer to the Magic Kingdom as Disney World. Yet, around a year ago, I saw comments made that this is exactly what Disney has become. It has transformed into the place that anti-Disney people once thought it was. Looking around though, they're right. It's a place that panders to small children, eliminating any sense of substance in favor of provoking kids to beg their parents for toys, as is the case with Epcot. It's a place that relies heavily on Disney's damaged brand of Star Wars, promising the ultimate adventure but failing to deliver. Marvel is the same way as well. The thing is, is that brands can only get you so far. You can't just slap a character onto something and think that people will come regardless of what you do with it. The Disney brand has certainly evolved and also means many things to many people. For those of us who have been going for quite some time, we recognize that the Disney brand didn't just include their various intellectual properties, but also meant top tier theming and experiences in their theme parks. For the outsiders, Disney has drawn in new fans of Marvel and Star Wars, but what will the Disney brand mean to them? It will be cheap and superficial, overpromising and delivering very little. People who will bring their kids for the first time because Disney's promoting Elsa and Remy will be met with extraordinarily overpriced hotels that offer nothing that can't already be found outside of Disney property. Everyone will experience understaffed parks with mediocre attractions, wondering why they waited 80 minutes for Slinky Dog Dash when they could have gone to Six Flags instead. They will be wondering why they spent money to skip the lines, yet haven't really seen any benefit. They will wonder why that one friend or family member who was always talking about how great Disney was, is now saying to go to Universal instead. Disney parks have remained crowded because so many people have yet to experience them. If you're watching, there's a good chance you've heard that the recent surge in attendance is due to pent-up demand. Disney and Universal saw their best years yet in 2021, and much of this is attributed to the shutdowns and the cancelled vacations of so many during the last few years. Suddenly, everyone whose vacations were cancelled all came at once leading to a false sense of success that I'm not sure Disney would have seen otherwise. It is certainly true that Disney has opened a slate of new attractions over the last five years, leading of course to increased attendance because people are curious to see the new additions. Yet, with the cultural narrative turning against Disney because of how unpleasant their new policies are, and with how brazenly they attempted to nickel and dime park goers, will many of these first timers return? Will this slate of new but aggressively mediocre attractions really bring people back? I believe that implementing the version of the Disney brand that exists within the minds of the executives is very different from what their visitors are experiencing. Disney will see many short-term gains. 
but I have a feeling that over the next few years, especially with Universal set to open Epic Universe and transforming its Florida property into a truly competitive multi-day destination resort, that Disney is going to struggle to retain its attendance numbers. You can only get so far on brand until you destroy its meaning. As a quick example, one of my favorite resorts aesthetically is the Grand Floridian. Its theming is an elegant throwback to Florida high society of the early 20th century. You can find elements of this not just through the interior design, but through the various art displays in the hotel and its lobby. Elements of the theming can even be found in unexpected places, such as the DVC advertisements or even the bathroom signs. Yet, we know that Disney leadership is completely incapable of sticking to an interesting theme, and the Grand Floridian is a fantastic example of this degradation. For example, just because people in the early 20th century were drinking out of ornate teapots, doesn't mean that the inclusion of Chip and Mrs. Potts are thematically appropriate. It doesn't mean that the pool area needs a Mad Hatter themed water playground just because he drinks tea. The worst offender is actually the lobby bar, which is called the Enchanted Rose. For no discernible reason, it's themed to Beauty and the Beast because... Disney! Traditionally, if the company were to announce a new hotel, I would have expected something that was highly themed and give you a reason to stay on their property. Yet after building a largely unthemed DVC tower with the Riviera Resort, I'm not surprised to find out that Disney is destroying sightlines by introducing another unthemed tower to the Polynesian. The Disney brand has reached a point where I associate it with degeneracy. Every announcement they make is met with dislike and inherent skepticism, because the company almost always fails to deliver on the Disney standard that it was once known for. Recently, Disney announced a new venture called Story Living by Disney, where they work with developers to slap their name onto generic neighborhoods. It's nothing more than a quick cash grab, indicating that executives think that the Disney name is strong enough on its own to drive up prices and demand. Still, perceptions of this company and its leadership is changing very quickly. You cannot rely on your brand when you are making every effort to damage it in the eyes of your consumers. To reflect, this particular video was definitely less structured than the normal video essay that I would do, appearing more as a rant and reflecting many thoughts I've had on the state of this company. Still, I wish we were in a place where we were speaking about the exceptional nature of Disney and talking about the merits of new and interesting attractions as opposed to the garbage that we've been receiving lately. I would be thrilled that if instead of replacing older but classic attractions, the company would instead be addressing such high demand by opening new ones. This would be a much better solution instead of trying to price everyone out except for the wealthy. I would love to see the park experience becoming a priority instead of doing the absolute bare minimum to entice people to return, all the while testing limits to see what they will and will not tolerate with how much you transparently attempt to take from their wallets. Simply put, the Disney brand is in the process of becoming severely damaged. How long can that go on before Disney starts to hurt for visitors? Only time will tell, I suppose, but I think that the breaking point is only just a few years away. If you enjoy this type of content and would like to help the channel out, a really easy thing to do is just simply hit the like button or share the video around if you've been frustrated with how the company has been run. As always, I recommend subscribing with bell notification so as to be alerted when new videos are released.